ladies and gentlemen, growing up in foreign countries often makes parents concerned about their children and their adaptation in their new environment and culture. Hence, learning objectively can tailor a more pleasant and a more acceptable environment to cope with. The following promo is about a remarkable publication which is effectively contributing to familiarizing children with cross cultures. As parents, we do our best to keep our kids healthy and raise them to be happy and successful. One element of success today is to give them a global perspective. But how do we start? I wrote Growing Up Global, Raising Children to Be at Home in the World to answer that question. I spent about 20 years of my career helping governments and companies succeed amidst globalization. I've lived in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, and the U.S., and my religious heritage is rooted in four of the world's faiths. A year after 9-11, I spent a few weeks in China on business and was most struck by what seemed like the grooming of their children for the global economy. What were we doing to prepare American kids? I found so many resources, but not an easy-to-use guide for my busy family. So the result of six years of research, thousands of conversations, and my own family's experiences is Growing Up Global. In the book, I offer hundreds of ideas on a budget. Start with what you love, like sports and games, music, books, or movies. Try new foods. Learn greetings in various languages. Growing Up Global offers ideas within driving distance that can bring a new culture alive. The book also offers suggestions for meaningful service, local and global, to start making a difference. You don't need a PhD in international relations, and you don't need to purchase plane tickets to experience the world and feel at home in it. Growing Up Global offers a toolbox for every parent and educator. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth round Persian Golden Lioness Award in literature goes to the author of Growing Up Global, Homa Tavangar from the United States. Let us view her message to the Academy. I'd like to thank the World Academy of Arts, Literature and Media for your outstanding efforts in cultural diplomacy. I'm honored to receive this Persian Golden Lioness Award for my book, Growing Up Global. The award is particularly significant to me because of my Persian heritage, which has been such a source of beauty and wonderment for me. I've been inspired by so many Iranians throughout the process of writing about how to pass along a world-embracing vision for all children. Thank you also to the Drs. Dorbayani for your commitment to diverse arts and intellectual pursuits. Efforts like yours can do so much to help bring people together. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before announcing the next award in Persian studies, let us view a short clip selected from his numerous contributions. But Cyrus was a very different kind of king. He refused to enslave his new subjects, a revolutionary concept in the ancient world. He recognized the local validity, if you will, of different religions and beliefs and uh, allowed those things to, to persist. In 539, Cyrus conquered Babylon, but he did not present himself as a conqueror. He presented himself as a liberator, rescuing these people from their despotic ruler. And then he did a totally unprecedented thing. He freed the Jews. The Jews had been living in Babylon in captivity ever since Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and their temple. And Cyrus freed them. Now, it could be said in hindsight or political history that Cyrus was looking for a buffer state between a hostile Egypt and his own empire. But so what? 
The point is, is that no one had ever done anything like this, and hardly anyone has ever done anything like it since. And subsequently, he is the only Gentile in the Bible to be referred to as Mashiach, or Messiah. As uh, one distinguished Oxford scholar once said to me, Cyrus always had a very good press. It's a, it's a very true uh, statement. Ladies and gentlemen, the award of Persian studies for his contribution to Persian archaeological research goes to Professor David Stronach, OBE, from the University of California, Berkeley. Please view his message to the Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am most honored and most pleased to be a recipient of a WELM award. Certain reflections of the award are of course in my hands at this moment. I dare say that this award recognizes the many years that I've spent on excavations, mainly in Iran, during a lifetime in archaeology. In this context, I remember Professor Roman Gershman, for long the doyen of all the archaeologists who were active in Iran, being asked what he attributed his longevity and his still notable energies to. And he replied with a broad smile, to the rays of the Iranian sun. Perhaps I benefited too. At all events, if one has had the good fortune to have had a long career in Iranian archaeology, I know that you usually have a lot to be thankful for. The sites are magnificent, the landscapes memorable, and the people warm and generous. In expressing my thanks for this award, I'd like to say a few words about one particular site that I have spent much of my life thinking about and writing about. That site is Pasagadi, or Pasagad, which, as you all know, was the capital of Cyrus the Great, one of the more just and enlightened rulers that history has known. One of the things that always intrigued me about this extraordinary site, from the time I first worked there in 1961, was the fact that it still retained faintly visible traces of a very ancient garden. Apart from all else, I always reflected that, in some way, this garden might give us further clues about the tastes and the innovative, innovative mind of Cyrus. Yet the way I came to discover the real importance of the garden is almost laughable. After I'd completed the excavation of the garden, following Ali Sami's early work in the area, and had published a plan of it in, in, in this book, as two back-to-back -back rectangles, I was asked to help to produce a reconstruction of the garden with the aid of a draftsman who was living hundreds of miles away from where I was. And he placed a straight row of bushes right in front of Cyrus's external throne seat so that all he could see of his 200-meter garden 200 meter long garden was the bush right in front of him. At first I was furious, but then I realized that if I moved the line of bushes a little to the left or a little to the right, Cyrus would have had his desirable view of power going right down through the length of his whole garden. And with that adjustment I realized that the two rectangles would be divided and we would and then we would have a fourfold garden or a chahabach. I do not know if the garden was meant to echo one of Cyrus's major titles as king of the four quarters, but I do know that from this time onwards the Persian garden became one of the many civilizing influences that the world owes to ancient Iran. Thank you very much. <laughs>